Thanks, everyone, for coming. And uh, thanks to Carol for that shout out. That was incredibly classy. Uh, OK, so let's begin. If you ask a airplane designer about safety, they'll say something like, nothing's foolproof, but modern airliners are incredibly resilient. Flying is the safest way to tra travel. If you ask building designers about elevator safety, they'll say something like, elevators are protected by multiple tried and tested fail-safe mechanisms. They're nearly incapable of falling. If you ask a software engineer about computerized voting, they'll say something like, that's terrifying. <laughs> Our entire field is bad at what we do, and if you rely on us, everyone will die. <laughs> we can do better than this. <laughs> OK, so let's fix the problem. Um, I think, oh no, my slide is fucked. <laughs> We're going to fix this problem with a nice hack. Oh, you know, this is totally fine. OK. Uh, yeah, let's fix the problem. Well, I found this uh, to-do list on developers. You know, I think this is just the, the to-do list that programmers are following. They, they were writing crappy software, so all we have to do is fix it. We just cross that off and write quality software. Um, but wait a minute, though, because I, uh, I found the rest of this to-do list. And it also says on here, prevent code reuse. And now the poop emojis are back, and there's two of them. Uh, and I think what was happening is that they were following this guide here on how to prevent your software from being widely used. Um, well, if you use garbage collection, then uh, you have unpredictable stop the world latency glitches, and you can never escape from that. That's not really something that's allowed to happen in real-time applications, such as airplanes, pacemakers, music, or video production software. Uh, if you have automatic heap allocation, um, then you are signed up for crashes or hangs when the system runs out of memory. Um, that's problematic for a lot of environments, including desktops, but especially embedded or kernels. Uh, if your code is slower than C, someone's going to rewrite it in C. <laughs> Got to go fast. <laughs> if it doesn't, speaking of C, if it doesn't speak the C ABI, then it's not even really usable for most languages. So for example, uh, a Perl application is not going to take advantage of a Python library, or vice versa. Uh, and finally, uh, you can prevent your software from being widely used by making it complicated to build from source, like TensorFlow. Basically, Docker was invented to solve that last problem. Uh, OK, so we're going to have to go back to this to-do list. And we're going to have to cross, cross off that one and promote code reuse. That's what we want to do instead. I think that if we, if we just edit sort of the to-do list of all the programmers, this should solve the problem. Um, so let's see what the implications of this are. OK. I actually sneakily there with my little x's just instantly disqualified all the, basically all the mainstream programming languages. You can't use any of them if you want to write software up to this standard of quality. You can't. If, if you use any of these programming languages and Go is in there, then you're, you're signed up for situations where people can't use your code uh, and where you can't handle certain error situations. Um, OK, well, let's see what we actually have to use with like, what's left. So I'll pull up the, um, the TOB language popularity list here. There's the, there's the top 10. I'm going to cross off all the disqualified languages. Uh, OK, so we got C, <laughs> C++, assembly language, and then all the, you know, the ones after 10 that I, I didn't put on there, because let's, let's, let's try to keep this talk down to, you know, to 45 minutes. Uh, it technically is possible to write uh, software that meets the standard of quality that we want to achieve with assembly. But uh, it's not very practical, so I'm going to cross that one off. Uh, honestly, the same is true for C++. Uh, it's so freaking complicated, I can barely even read my own C++ code, let alone my coworkers. Uh, I like to think of C++ like this. You know, it's, got a lot of, it's got a lot of features. 
And some of those features do violate these principles that I laid out, and some of them don't. It's really hard to know which ones do and which ones don't. I'm, I'm going to cross that off. I think that's a pretty a safe decision to do. So here we are. You know, we're left with C. Uh, and you know, the other languages, again, that we're just not, I, don't, I don't have time to go over in this talk. Uh, and OK, so let's use it. Let's write some high quality software in C. OK, so let's try it. Let's go. Well, when you start to do that, you start to see a lot of problems. So for example, we have uh, pound include. It's a fundamental limitation dragging down the entire language. It's the main reason for slow compilation, uh, prevents optimizations, and makes the developer's life harder. I'll show you an example of that later. Uh, you also run into preprocessor macros. The C preprocessor is another language on top of the C programming language, and the two languages don't know about each other. Uh, the C preprocessor makes it harder for humans to read and debug your code. Uh, it's not compatible with API bindings, so it actually disallows the C ABI from being a language of interop. Um, and it prevents IDEs from working correctly. Like, we need IDEs. You can't use IDEs with preprocessor macros. Um, but the C pr programming language just forces you to use them. I'll show you that, about that later as well. And finally, we just uh, we're all listening to Carol talk about this important little kicker here, which is that not only does C have a lot of undefined behavior, it's also just a lot of unnecessary undefined behavior that's really easy to trip into. Uh, it's really hard to write high quality software in C without making these kind of mistakes. Uh, OK, so there, can't use C. Um, OK, well, I'm going to make a new language then. We've got, we got to have a new language. It's better. So, but let's not get out of control. Let's just let's try to fix the problems with C. Actually, that would be a pretty good slogan for Zig. Like, you know, C, but with the problems fixed. <laughs> uh, and it, it, it's my goal. It's still my goal uh, to not get carried away, like adding a lot of stuff. There's a lot. There's a lot of features that are not in Zig, and that's very intentional. And it's hard because um, you know everyone likes to propose features, and you know it's really easy to make fun of C++. You know. But everyone has that one feature from C++ that they like, and they want to put it in, in your language. They want to put it in Zig. And if everyone had their favorite feature from C++ in Zig, it would just be C++. But I'm not going to let that happen. Um, OK, so premise. Going to make a new language. Start with C, and let's just fix some of the problems. So I'm going to throw some code up on the screen here. Look, we're looking at some C code. Uh, Feel free to come up closer if you're in the back. There's lots of seats up here. Um, so this is just hello world, you know, just so you can see some C code there. Now, I'm going to show you an example of some code that I think should work. Like, this is just going to be C code, and it's like, why is there a compiler error? OK, so first, I'm going to take the string. I'm going to move it to variable. So far, same thing. Now I want to have a, a global constant, which is just the length of the message. Um, so I try to do that. I get compiler. Initializer element's not constant. Well, why doesn't this work? Like, this, sh this should work fine. You know, do I really have to just go up here and be like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. OK, I put six in there. Like, all right, now it builds. Like, is that, is that what I'm supposed to do? Like, now if I change the text to hell, you know, and now it's going to be wrong, and, and actually it's a security vulnerability because it's overflowing the buffer. It's like, C is just trying to make you have security vulnerabilities in it. Like, why, why, can't, why can't you just do Sterling like that and get the answer? Um, so here's another example. And I think this is actually kind of even worse. If I use the constant as the array length, uh, it actually successfully compiles, but for a sinister reason. This is an accidental variable length array. So that buffer length actually could have just been any value, like even argc, and it would have worked. And that's, that's just asking for a stack overflow. Like, that's not what we wanted. It's, and, and it's really obvious to see what's happening here if we move the, the array to global scope, like this. Now it's compile error. So it sort of mattered whether you know, the, that, that value was compile time known value or not, but it was sort of C was sort of hiding the problem from us inside, inside the function. 
but I think this should work. Like, why can't I write this code? Like, is this how I have to do it? I have to put, use a preprocessor macro to make it work? I mean, apparently, and this is what you have to do. It's sad that this is what fixed it. You know, I, I, I said it before, but I'll say it again. Macros are hostile to debugging, they're hostile to IDEs, and they're hostile to programmers trying to read the code. Uh, I'll show you an example of that. Let's say that you see this code, this is some C code, and you don't know what's in the rest of the file, above it or below it. You just see this code. What do you think it's gonna do? Should be pretty, like, we would like to just understand this code from only seeing the local context. In fact, if I run this, it actually goes to this branch. Uh, and and it's kind of a trick question. So yeah, it turns out you could do something like this. Yeah, you could, use, you could do monkey patching with the preprocessor. And now, okay, it's a contrived example. No one's gonna do that exactly. But I think that we've all had experiences where our coworkers thought they were being like, helpful and clever, but they wrote what kind of just amounted to this. <laughs> and so it shouldn't be possible to look at this code and not be sure what it does. That makes C really hard to understand because you have to know, to be really sure, to be really sure what's going on, you have to know a lot more context than what, only what you're looking at. So I deleted this feature from C. I deleted pound includes and I deleted defines. Get, a, get the, pre, the whole preprocessor gone. Good riddance. So let's go back to that other, other problem here. The other problem that I was in the middle of, of looking at where we make a constant and we just want to use the constant, but we're not allowed to use it. So I think that the fact that this doesn't work makes C more complicated. Like C is a, a, a bigger, more complicated language because this doesn't work. And if you, if you buy that reasoning, then it would follow that Zig is simpler to understand than C because this does work in Zig. I will show you. So we're looking at the first Zig code of the talk here now. This is the equivalent thing as what we were just looking at before. Um, but it works. And it just works fine. So all we had to do, all I had to do to make this work is just treat everything like an expression uh, and then just be able to evaluate expressions at compile time. So this entire part here is an expression, even the U8, the type is an expression, and this text is an expression, and it's pretty easy to evaluate. We just look up the symbol and the answer is 666, hail Satan. So, <laughs> should this work then? What if we make it more complicated? Uh, now I've taken the expression, and now it's a function call. Anybody have any opinions? Well, I do. Yeah, it should definitely work. Like, of course, of course it should work. Like, I just said everything's an expression, that's an expression. Like, why, why wouldn't it be able to just go run a function call? Like, of course that should work. Okay, but think about what that means now. What that means is that Zig has to be able to look at a function and actually just go through and, and figure out what the result of code is at compile time. So it does. We got here from a reasonable premise. Um, so I, I just want to make the argument here that this isn't me, you know, writing a language paper and you know, sitting on my hoity-toity throne and stuff. It's like I, I just C was broken and I fixed it, and that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, okay. So, but once we have this sort of concept, we need to flesh it out a little bit. So, for example, uh, here's some more Zig code, and in the test case there, I'm computing Fibonacci of seven into the variable x. But if I were to try to use it in an array, I would get a compiler error from Zig saying, hey, that's not a constant value. We don't know, I don't know what it is. You can only use constant values for array lengths. So I'm gonna need to be explicit and say, yeah, I actually do need you to go evaluate this function at compile time and now x is known to compile time. Now we can use it in an array as the array length, and it will work. So you can use the comp time keyword to tell an expression that it must be evaluated at compile time, or you'll get an error. You can, and it takes any expression, so it can be a block. So for example, I could say x equals comp time, 
and now I have a labeled block. Everything in the block runs the compile time. We get a result, and I, we have this function at the end here, and this actually just logs this value here, um, 45. And we actually didn't run any code yet. This is the, the compile log actually created an error. But now I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to replace the, that. I replaced it with an assert. So same code. I just moved it over so I could fit the output. And instead of logging the output, I'm actually asserting that the answer is 45. So uh, if you now what the important part about this, though, is that the assert happens at compile time. So if I take this value 10 and I change it to an 11, I actually get a compile error from this assert. This is an incredibly powerful feature because if you can figure out some invariance of your, of your um, code at compile time, you can assert those invariants and you're preventing yourself from shooting yourself in the foot, preventing your coworkers from shooting themselves in the foot, and saving countless hours of debugging because you've got a compile error instead of a bug. So fleshing this out some more, um, here I'm using a, uh, compile time expressions inside of a function, but I also might just want to just statically make an assertion, um, just like I was saying just now. So you can also make a top level declaration, which is comp time. Here I'm just doing a very simple assertion that 10 plus one is 11. So of course that works. Uh, if I try to assert something wrong, then of course I'm gonna get a compiler error. Okay. Now let me take a step back for a second here. Started with C, got mad at the preprocessor, so I deleted that. Fixed the bug where you can't use constants as long as you know the value at compile time. And now we actually fixed a problem where we even solved conditional compilation. So in C, we had to use the preprocessor to do this. So this is an example where it says, you know, on Windows, do this. On Linux, do this. And I mean, the, I get, this is two different languages happening here. And you have to be aware of the semantics of both of them at the same time. And I've seen people do some weird stuff where they put an expression, and then there's an if def in the middle of the thing, and there's a parentheses dangling off. Like, what? stop. Uh, that's how you have to do it in C. I just deleted this feature. So did we accidentally lose conditional compilation in Zig? Uh, no, actually, it's way better. Um, how it works is if the conditions of an if statement is known at compile time, uh, then the branches that are dead are eliminated statically. So this compile error is never admitted. It's problem solved. There's only one language here, not, not two. Uh, okay. So the green boxes are highlighting the fact that because the value is compile time known, it has a different semantics. So it matters whether or not, in Zig, it matters whether or not your value is known at compile time. So you might need to, for example, um, make a parameter required to be compile time known. This actually relates to the Swift stuff that Rob was talking about. A um, good example of this is with the warn function. Um, this formatting string here is a parameter that must be compile time known. And we can see that because if I take away this x right here, I get a compile error, not a runtime error, which means that the implementation of this function triggered a compile error based on the, the knowledge at compile time of that string. Um, so. For example, if I here, I, I pass a runtime value over the format string, and it's going to be a compiler error because at the call site of warn, it requires, right here, we require the parameter to be compile time known. And that's why we get this error if it's not compile time known. The cool thing about this is that the imp I didn't show the implementation of this function, but it's all in Zig. There's no, uh, there's no compiler magic to make it work. So for example, in, in C, all the warnings you get from printf, if you do it wrong, those are just hard-coded magic in the compiler. Um, I was always, I was, uh, 
and I, I hope this doesn't come off as like a, a diss or something, but I was trying to, I was getting inspiration from Rust when I was trying to figure out how they solve this problem, um, and it's a macro, and I was trying to understand the macro, and then I got down to the sort of like the bottom of the macro, and then it called this function that was like underscore underscore like compiler hard coded printf macro. It's like, oh, okay, it's actually built into the compiler. But here we have a language where I took C and made it simpler, and actually I'm able to implement um, formatted printing in the language itself, no compiler magic. Um, so let's consider the implications of this. We have parameters that can be forced to be compiled time known. Everything's an expression, including types. So what if I did this? Got a function, takes a type as a parameter, returns a type. Well, congratulations, we now have generics. So here's, here's what I'm saying right now. I didn't, I, again, I didn't go in and say like, okay, gonna put on my you know, language hat, you know, a little pointy wizard hat, and I'm gonna go read some white papers, and I'm like, let's see how to do generics. Like, no, no, I, I, I just took C, deleted the bad stuff from it, and then generics like fell onto my lap. Uh, okay, so let's, let's back up for a second and recap here. I want software to be really high quality. Your hard drive better be literally on fire for there to be a bug. Uh, most programming languages are disqualified because they, they have some flaw where they, they can't handle a certain situation or an edge case or they, their code can't be reused so no one's gonna use it. Okay, and C++ is too complicated. C, too problematic. Gotta make a new language. And I just showed you the comp time features of Zig. Um, I have time to show you errors uh, in, the build, in the build system. And then uh, we'll do Q&A. So, errors. Errors are a central theme in Zig. Uh, because in order to have high quality software, correct error handling has to be the easiest, most straightforward path for people to follow. People are always gonna just be lazy, so better make the lazy path the correct path. Um, okay, so let's look at uh, a really simple example. So this is C code. Um, what it's gonna do is it's gonna open a file, but the directory doesn't exist, so that's gonna fail. Uh, but this code is written in the laziest, easiest way to code, which is just not to handle errors. Uh, so let's see what happens. Okay, so I'm gonna run it. I'm gonna build it and run it. Uh, it seems to actually work, which is weird, okay? <laughs> let's look at that with strace. Okay, now this revealed some information here. Uh, the operating system actually returned no such file or directory, and then returned negative one for the file descriptor, and then the code just blithely continued on and said, okay, now I'm gonna write to the negative one file descriptor, and then the operating system said, no, that's the wrong, that doesn't work. And it's okay, now I'm gonna close the negative one file descriptor, and the operating system said, no, it's, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> And then, just, to, just to, as, as a final sin, it exited with zero, saying, everything worked. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's look at what the laziest, easiest way to write this is in Zig. This is Zig code. Um, and I just sort of, you know, I didn't use the abstractions or anything, I just wrote it sort of the same style as the C code. Um, okay, so let's see what happens here. Yeah, this doesn't compile because those things can have errors and we didn't handle them. Um, okay, so let's handle the errors. All right, now I used uh, the word try, and I put an exclamation point on the, in front of the return type. So that means that this function now can return a possible error, and what try does, um, there's an analogous feature to this in Rust, uh, what it does is it takes the results, and it says if it's an error, return the error from the function, otherwise give me the value. Uh, so now when we run this uh, updated code example, we're gonna get some different output. Now, uh, what we're looking at here is we have the error that happened, file not found, and we have an error trace that tells you where did the error first happen and how did it bubble up through the whole system. So if you compare that to the output we got from the C code, when we ran the C code, it wasn't even apparent that there was a problem. 
when we ran the zig code, we already know how to fix the bug. OK, so I just showed you mandatory but convenient error handling. And that was a error return trace that we were just looking at. Don't worry, we'll see another one. Um, now I'm going to show you a little bit more of a familiar concept, related concept, which is stack traces. Uh, so let's have another look. This is C code again. Um, what I have here is a tr trivial program that's going to trip an assertion. So if I run this, um, I can see some pretty useful output. Uh, we got the name of the file, got the name of the line number, the function that it's in, um, the expression that failed. And to top it off, we have an abort signal. So if you run it with a debugger, it'll, it'll take you right to the problem. Pretty good. But it's missing some context. Uh, if you, in this trivial program, it's pretty obvious why, how we got to foo. But in a more complicated software, it's not going to be so clear. So I've just translated the code into zig. You can see the structure is the same. And when I run this, I'm going to put the output on another slide because it's, it's more text. All right, here's what we're looking at now. We have all the information we had from before, um, but more. We have the entire stack trace telling you how the control flow got to the function that asserted. Uh, and this works on all the supported targets. Works on Mac, Windows, Linux, FreeBSD. Uh, yep. And yeah, so there's, there's an important reason that this is on by default and it works this way. And it's that one of my strategies for making Zig programmers write high quality code is to make handling errors fun, right? Like if, if it's just kind of fun to write correct software, then people are going to do it more. Uh, and so I want to show you a particularly fun interaction that happens when you uh, have an error unwrapping that fails. So here is an example. I took, I took the example from before. We're going to try and open a file that's going to, you know, the directory doesn't exist. Now I took off the tries. I took off the exclamation point, And I put in catch unreachable. That's, the, that's how we're going to handle these errors in this example. The syntax is a little awkward intentionally, because this is an inadvisable way to handle this situation. This is what you do when you can guarantee that the error will not happen which is just not a thing for the open syscall. But let's see what happens, though. So we're going to build this in debug mode, which means that we're going to get a lot of help trying to figure out what went wrong. So when I run this code, this is the output that I get. It's a lot of information. Let me break it down for you. First, this text tells us that somewhere, catch unreachable was violated, and it actually caught an error. Um, next. The name of the error code that eventually was caught that was unexpected. Uh, next, we have a stack trace. And note that I've only highlighted sort of the bottom half here. Um, the function that failed is at the top of this stack trace here, right? This is exactly where the problem is, right here. And this is how we, this is how we got there from, from main, from the, from the starting symbol. Um, and then what we have above that is an error return trace. It's a different concept. I, I invented this concept. Um, and it, it's, it's a, a really efficient way to report the locations in the code where errors originated and propagated through the system. And the really cool thing about this is that they flow together so perfectly, because the end of the error return trace is the beginning of the stack trace. Um, and then to top it off, again, we have the abort signal. So if you use a debugger, you, don't, you can just go in and do what you need to do. OK. So that was stack traces and error unwrapping. Um, now I'm going to talk about cleanup code. And just to warn you, there's going to be a lot of code on this slide, but don't try to read it. You're just, I'm just kind of showing you the indentations of it. So this is C code that is going to use um, libsound.io to make a sine wave. And what it's going to do is it's going to uh, correctly clean up all the, the allocations and resources when it, um, when it closes. So whenever you see an indentation here, what's going on is it's it encountered an error. So it's freeing everything from before and then exiting. And you can see that the, indent the, the parts that are indented sort of get longer towards the bottom. And if I were to describe the control flow, it would look like this. So all the red arrows are pointing um, from the, the basically like the destroy functions to the create functions. 
And this is sort of the what you this is sort of what your brain has to do if you try to edit this code, right? It's very problematic. I've even heard the fact that this is I mean, this causes a lot of real bugs in real software, and I've even heard that as an argument for just not even bothering to um, deal with the fact that memory allocation can fail. You know, they say oh, it's too hard, it's too buggy to handle failure. Just give up, just settle for bad software. No, screw that. We're gonna we're gonna write good software. Uh, so there, there there's a strategy that C programmers use to to mitigate this, and it's the uh, the go to strategy. So again, don't try to read the code too much. I'll put the arrows back on for you. It's a lot better. It's only three. So this uses go to, and it puts a cleanup block at the bottom. Um, there, it does come with uh, some compromises, though. So we did have to move the variable declarations away from where they're initialized. And we also had to introduce the concept of nullability. So before, it wasn't possible. F I mean, technically, it was possible, but it wasn't necessary for these variables to be null. Now it's required for them to be null for some period of time and then become initialized later. Um, OK. Now I'm going to show you um, Zig's way of doing this. And actually, the code is short enough that I could blow up the font size and you can probably read it. Uh, and I just want to point out, um, this is real code. The C code was real code. All, all three of these examples make a sine wave. But all three of them, including this Zig code, are using a C library. Okay. Zig is better at using C libraries than C is at using C libraries. Because if I put those arrows on the screen, this is what they look like. You probably can't even see the tails of them because they're so short. Um, this is using the defer keyword. It's not a new concept. Um, I, just, I just took a concept that makes sense, put it where it belongs. Uh, and so that's, that's how cleanup works in Zig. And there's one more um, concept that's important to this too. Uh, and it's related to defer, but it's actually like error defer. And how this works is that, see, this is error defer. And what's going on is that this function can return a possible error. And so if anything fails, what's going on here is that this, this device is a resource that's getting allocated. And it needs, to, it needs to survive if we return success. Here it is. But it definitely needs to get cleaned up if we error out. So you can still have this nice pattern where you do resource allocation, resource cleanup, resource allocation, resource cleanup. And at any point, if the function has to bail out with an error, then the error defer is run. So these two concepts, defer and error defer, um, they prevent any kind of that spaghetti cleanup code that, that you would otherwise have to do. And uh, in practice, I've, ob I've observed that there's no other cases. They, 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 these handle all of the, all of the possible situations. Um, OK, so that was cleanup code. Uh, let's look at error sets. Um, so once again, I want to turn to this example here. And I'm showing you the final uh, option that Zig is going to give you for handling errors. This is catch. And what catch does is it's sort of like a default. It says, if you had an error, here, do this, uh, here, here's what you need to do instead of to, to get the value. Um, I want to show you this so that I can show you what happens if you switch on the error code. So let me show you that. Same thing, but now what I've done is I've, I'm on, the, on the right call, I catch an error and I immediately switch on it. And I didn't even handle any of the cases. So let's see what happens when I try to run this through the compiler. It tells me exactly the set of errors that were possible. Um, this concept is, again, not new. It's just a good idea. So I put it where it belongs. Um, so now I'll go in. I'll, I'll copy all those possible errors into the switch. And uh, in fact, I even added an extra one to show you what happens. And you can see that the compiler has told me that that is not a possible error. I should delete it. Thank you, compiler. I will do that. Uh, so what's important here is that you can, you can handle errors in such a way that you exhaustively handle every error perfectly. And you know that if the situation ever changes, that there's a new possible error code, or one becomes no longer possible, the compiler will tell you to come back and fix your code. So you can know that you're, you're exhaustively handling all of the situations. OK, 
That was error sets. We're done with that. Done with errors. Now I'm going to tell you about the build system. Um, OK, so what's a build system? It's all the stuff that your system has to have installed in order for your project to build. Uh, and that includes the libraries that you depend on. So let's look at another case study. Um, this is a libpng, you know, if you just want to make a PNG file or something. And this is written in C, so I just unzipped it, um, listed all the files. Let's see what we can learn here. Like, what, what does my system have to have for me to be able to participate in this software development? Well, I definitely need a C compiler. I see there's some C source there. Um, OK. I see that I'm going to need auto tools, so I better install that. Um, See, I also brought, I need make, GNU make, gonna have to install that for this to work, okay? But wait a minute, what's this? This is the output of auto tools. Why do they, why do they commit the output of, the, of auto tools in here? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because someone didn't have auto tools installed and they filed a bug report and the person got fed up with it and they said, fine, POSIX shell is the easier system dependency to have than auto tools. Um, but wait a minute, what's this? <laughs> We also have CMake here. Uh, I'm just going to guess what happened here, but I'm pretty sure what happened is, even after this happened, you know, the libpng developers, they tried to build it on Windows, and they went, oh, crap, Windows doesn't have POSIX shell or GNU make. What are we going to do? So they introduced CMake so that you know, all you have to have is MSVC and CMake, so a little easier to do install. Um, and, but they, never, they didn't actually remove these other files from, the, you know, from their source because who knows what people have installed on their computers? It's unpredictable, and they just want to stop getting bug reports for having not people not being able to build their code. Um, what's not obvious from this list of files is that it also depends on Zlib. And so again, you have to install a different library before this will even work. Um, so that's, that's just status quo. Let me show you what it would look like if we had coded uh, libpng and zig. Um, and you know, if we didn't want all the man pages and stuff. So, okay, uh, there's the implementation and there's uh, the build script. So we're definitely going to need the zig compiler, that makes sense. Um, but the build script's also written in zig, so that's just the same dependency. It's just one thing. And that works everywhere. You know, that works on Windows, that works on Linux, it works on Mac. So, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot easier of a dependency to have. OK, well, what if I don't want to write it in Zig, though? What if I just want to write, what if I just want to take the existing C code, uh, but I want to use the Zig build system? OK, well, definitely going to need the Zig compiler for the Zig build system. And OK, well, for the C code, I'm going to need to, wait, what? Yeah, no, yeah, we just need Zig for both. Because Zig also compiles C code. Yeah, no joke. Like, Zig is also a C compiler. Uh, so what happened is um, Zig has the ability to read H files. I just showed you that example where we were making a sine wave with libsound.io. And I was telling you, yeah, we're, we're using the C library. Like, you can import the H file and call the functions and do all the stuff. And to do that, we use libclang. Um, so we already depended on libclang. And libclang is a C compiler. So I realized, why don't I just, so if you just type zig cc, it just jumps to main of clang. It works. It works fine. <laughs> but it's a kind of amusing that if you type zig cc dash dash version, it thinks it's clang, because it, it literally is. Um, but yeah, it, it totally works. So here's, uh, again, hello world in C, but now I'm using zig to build it. It works. If I put this extra parameter here, um, verbose cc, uh, then I can see the C command that was actually run. Um, and you can see that Zig adds some more parameters. Zig actually kind of uses the C compiler abilities intelligently. Um, so for one, Zig turns on all of the, uh, it turns on the makefile dependency generation. Uh, and once Clang finishes building, it will parse that file, look at all the dependencies, and use a sophisticated caching system to automatically cache all your C compilations. So you don't need make. You can just use zig. Uh, it will also um, have better defaults. So for example, if anyone here saw my talk from last year at Recurse Center, 
I showed an example of zig code that was faster than C and actually found out why that was. Uh, it's because I'm basically turning on MRH equals native on native targets and that's not on by default in C. Which sort of makes sense for C, but for Zig, it definitely makes sense to turn on for native targets because Zig just actually supports cross-compiling. Yeah, Zig is also a cross-compiling tool chain. So this all sort of comes together in this, this vortex of, of, of synergy. I'll show you what I mean. Um, so if I run this command Zig targets, um, it's gonna tell you all of these libc's that Zig supports. And how this works is that Zig actually ships with the header files for all of these libc's in this sort of like compressed way so it doesn't take that much um, data. Uh, and it ships with muscle source code and it ships with glibc uh, start file source code and it will lazily build whichever libc you want for the target from source on demand and then cache it with the cache system. So, what that means is that uh, not only can I use Zig code to um, cross compile for ARM 64 bit, for example, but also, uh, it, yeah, you can see that I, my, my file is in fact for ARM 64. Not only can I do that, but it also means that if you use Zig to compile C code, Zig is actually kind of a better C compiler than C compilers because. Uh, here I can target glibc, or I can target muscle and get a static executable. You can't do that with when you if you just download a C compiler with you know out of the box. That's not a feature that exists. Also, I could just do ARM 64-bit. Like here, I'm using Zig to cross compile C for a, a different architecture and building this alternate libc from source on demand. That's not something that C compilers can do. Uh, yeah. So that's the cross compiling tool chain. I'm going to show you Zig build. So I, I sort of teased this a little bit. I showed you build.zig. Um, let me just show you a real world example uh, so you can see how it works. So um, this is an example project of Tetris. Um, this actually, I'll, maybe I can link this later, but it, this, this exists, it's open source. Um, so if we look at all the files here, we can see what exists. Um, this is the build.zig file. This lets us use li literally the command zig build to build it. Um, I'll show you what it looks like. You know, don't focus on it too much, but just so you can see what it looks like. That's, that's the entire file. It's just a build script. You know, it says here's the source files, here's what you need to link against. Um, and it also defines commands. So here we're defining this play uh, step. And if I do, um, zig build dash dash help, you can see that play command that I defined is available. Uh, and so I'll go ahead and run that command. Uh, and it builds a code, it comes up, you can play the game. Um, that is zig build system. Uh, okay, so that's the three things I wanted to show you. Compile time stuff, taking errors seriously, built in build system. And now I just want to emphasize this point. Uh, everything I just showed you is available. You can go download it right now and use it. We just had a release a couple weeks ago. None of this is vaporware. This all works today. Um, so that, I just wanted to point that out. Uh, yeah. So that's it. Um, I want to say thank you to people who support me on Patreon. Uh, about a year ago, I quit my job to do this full time. Um, before that, I worked during the day, and I worked on this stuff on nights and weekends. Uh, it was like pretty stressful. Um, but now, thanks to people who support me, uh, I'm actually um, working on Zig during the day, and I'm training for a marathon with my brother on nights and weekends. So I'm really thankful that I can do that. I actually had to run uh, four miles before the talk today. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I, I really appreciate um, the support, and if you would like to support me, you can do that here. Uh, and without further ado, it is time for QA. My uh, internet on my computer is not working, so I have to look at my phone for the, for the questions. I don't know who wrote this software. Just kidding. 
I think I see a question that maybe was answered here. Oh, I see. They're all coming in. OK. I'm going to read them out loud so everyone can um, know what they are. Um, the ability to call a function in a constant context is part of the API contract of the function. How does Zig handle a function becoming non-const evaluable? This question states a incorrect assumption uh, before it asks the question. So I know that in C++ that is true, that the, um, you, you, ha you have to put const expert as part of the prototype of the function for that to work. It's not how it works in Zig. Um, in Zig, everything is uh, considered to be um, fair game for trying to evaluate at compile time. And if, if the compiler encounters something that's impossible to evaluate at compile time, it'll create a compile error. Um, otherwise, it will work. Um, things that are not allowed are inline assembly, uh, just random, like you know, converting an integer to a pointer and then dereferencing it, calling an external function. These things are not possible at compile time in Zig. It's not possible to crash the compiler by using the comp compile time facilities. Actually, it's very possible, but it's not supposed to be possible. <laughs> um, that's a good question, though. Uh, I hope I answered it. Feel free to ask a follow-up if that didn't answer the question. All right, the next one says, uh, why not just add the comp time keyword automatically um, when a value is used as a constant? Um, it does, uh, but it doesn't force evaluation. So, um, for example, if I were just to say const x equals 1 plus 2, that in fact will become the compile time known value of 3, and that's usable in all the compile time contexts. What it does not do is eagerly evaluate functions at compile time unless you ask it to. Um, there is an issue open for that, and I'd be happy to talk about it further in person if you find me. Um, how does Zig deal with dynamic memory allocation and garbage collection? Um, that's a good question. Zig does not do any dynamic memory allocation on your behalf. The language does none. Um, the standard library uh, also does none unless uh, it accepts an allocator as a parameter. So, so in in there, there's sort of two conventions, uh, sorry, two things to think about. Like, the, what does the language do? What does the standard library do? Um, language has no understanding of the heap whatsoever, not even part of its sphere of, of anything it knows about. The standard library uh, is not, uh, does not have any default memory allocator. So, for example, ArrayList, standard.ArrayList, when you create one, you give it an allocator, and that's how it's going to get its memory from. And it, as far as it's concerned, doesn't care where the memory is coming from. Um, there's no garbage collector. So um, Zig is not a safe language. That's an important uh, distinction to make. So there, there are a lot of um, things that, for example, uh, Rust will protect you from. Zig will not protect you from those things. Now, there is something that I'm really excited about that I uh, just opened a proposal for recently, um, which is to actually make it almost completely safe in debug and release safe modes. Um, that's a fun topic that I want to talk about, but I think I should probably move on with the, with the QA. Um, so, but let me just elaborate on one point here. So uh, Zig has four build modes. The default one is debug. The goal of debug is that there is no undefined behavior. Everything crashes if that would happen uh, in a way that helps you debug and figure out what's going on. It's not perfect. There's some things that can't be protected against. Now there's, and there's three release modes. The interesting one is release fast, because release fast is the one that says, all right, God, we're, we're going full SANIC, right? We're going <laughs> to. Everything that is undefined behavior is literally undefined behavior, and we're going to optimize all the way. That's really that's if you know that's pedal to the metal release fast. I would not recommend release fast mode for a web development team. I think that's a horrible idea. I might recommend it for a video game, like a shrink wrap video game that you chip to the the customer's uh, computer, or something like that. Um, and then the other 
the other two release modes are release safe, which turns on, on optimizations, but still keeps all the checks. Uh, and then the other one is release small. Uh, just, it just, it, it has undefined behavior to try to have a small binary size. But the important part about the release modes is that you can, um, you can mix them at the scope level. So for example, let's say I'm on a web development team. It's inappropriate to use release fast if I'm doing like agile or something. So I'm gonna use release safe. Uh, but you know, we looked at our code and there's a bottleneck in that one function. It needs to go faster. What do you do? Well, you can actually just say for this scope, for this function, actually do release fast for this part. And so you're, taking, you're saying like, okay, fine, in this area it's worth it. That's the kind of the build mode of that area of code that I need to have. Um, all right, let's go on. I think, let me answer some more questions here. Uh, why Zig and not Rust? Yeah, I knew I was gonna get that one. Um, <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I love Rust. I think Rust is a really, uh, really great project. And I think, I, I, I really, uh, I think that people who are into Rust, when they saw the beginning slides about like the airplanes and the elevators were just shaking their heads, yes, yes, like we're trying to do the same thing. Like, you know, we're all trying to accomplish the same goal here. Um, so I made that distinction between the language and a standard library before. Rust language, uh, like when, you know, when, let me, when I did all these uh, boxes, you know, about, um, I think I should actually go pull them up. I think that's a good idea. This is, this is gonna be worth it. Okay. Oh, that didn't go to where I wanted it to go. Start from current slide. Okay, so Rust, the language, uh, is fine. None of these things apply to it. Um, Rust, the standard library, is a little bit problematic in terms of this one. Uh, there's, if, if you just use the Rust standard library and you're not careful, there are ways to you might have, end up writing a library that someone couldn't use in a kernel, for example, or um, in a like embedded OS, uh, embedded programming situation, or something like that. Other than that, uh, it pretty much pretty much checks the boxes off here. Um, let's see, why Zig and Rust? There was one more thing I had on that topic. Yeah, I think the other the other thing, and this is just sort of like where these languages are. I think, they, I think that the, like, the goals of Zig and Rust are very aligned. Um, and I think sort of like the space for Zig is in that one slide of Carol's where it was like, it is complicated. And that is mostly the space that Zig exists in where we're saying, we want the simplicity and we're willing to take on a little more risk. Um, yeah, and yeah. so. I think that it's going to be interesting to find out if I can, um, if I can, if I can pull through in my ideas to make uh, debug and release safe modes as safe as I am hoping that I can make them. Uh, I think there might be some like real competition there. Um, if I can't, um, Rust looks like a real strong contender to be honest. Does Rust support custom elevators? It does. It, it does. Yeah. Um, but it's it. Uh, yeah, I know it does. I don't, I don't know how easy or how hard it is to accidentally do the wrong thing. I, the convention of, of the Rust standard library is to depend on a default allocator. And that convention breaks the second one here. Uh, OK, so let's see. What effort is required to prepare an arbitrary C library for use in Zig? The only effort required is to stop using the preprocessor. Um, if, and in fact, Zig actually is able to translate a lot of C preprocessor macros. Like if you just did, you know, pound define, uh, you know, so, like um, foo 10, Zig is gonna figure that one out. Zig actually has like a, its own C tokenizer just so it can parse and preprocessor macros. Um, but obviously if you do your preprocessor macro that's like, you know, define L per N, L, L per N, like what, what are we supposed to do with that? Like how am I supposed to translate that into Zig? That's not gonna work. Um, so if you don't do that, like if you just use function, if you don't have any preprocessor macros, um, Zig can use your C library 100%, no, uh, no, no bindings, like you can just use it. Uh, 
Shut up and take my money. <laughs> That's not a question. Get out of here. <laughs> um, that was actually very sweet. OK, so there's, I want to get to the, I'm really excited about all these questions, so I'm going to just try to keep going through them. Uh, I, I just love attention, so. Is it a, is it a semver breaking change to add a new error to an error set? That's a great question. Um, I'm going to push thumbs up. Yeah. Uh, yes. The answer is yes. So uh, in terms of philosophy, the idea here is we, we want to handle all, all possible error situations. That's, that's sort of the premise here. So if you're a library and you introduce a new way for something to fail, you are changing in a, in a breaking way the, the public API of your library, right? You've introduced a new failure condition. I think it's important that the consumers of that library could, are aware that that's a pretty important change. Um, yeah. Next question. Uh, what safeguards does Zig have for errors in memory slash pointer management? Um, that's a good question. So, uh, one of the, the big ones is that, um, unlike in C, uh, where pointers are sort of multi-purposed, in Zig, if you have if you have sort of like a, a a pointer to a block of memory, you don't use a pointer in Zig. You actually use a slice, and I think that's the same as Rust, and that's a um, that's a pointer and a length, right? So. If, if, you have a, if you have a block of memory, then the type that's being used knows the size, and so there's bounce checks. Um, and to be clear, I introduced all the build modes, and uh, when I, whenever I say checks or safety, that implies on precisely debug and release safe modes. On the, on, on the other build modes, they're not, those checks are gone. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, Zig also distinguishes between um, so Zig, does, unlike Rust, Zig does not have a like unsafe block. So there's no clear delineation of what code is safe and what's not. Um, but there are some things that just are safe and some things that are not safe. So for example, if you use if you use int to pointer, like that's just an unsafe function. Anytime you do it, right? If you're just going to say you know zero x one two three four. Let's see what's there. That's pretty unsafe. Um, but if you uh, but when you're, when you're choosing a pointer type, Zig actually distinguishes between a pointer to a single item and a pointer to an unknown number of items. And that, uh, you usually don't have a pointer to an unknown number of items. That's sort of like the unsafe kind of choice. Uh, and so the fact that most of the pointers that you use are sort of like pointers to a single item it prevents you from doing you know, accidents, like going to the next one, for example. Um, I also uh, have been working on a um, general purpose debug allocator. I've been uh, live streaming the coding on it. And um, it's, a, it's an allocator that's meant to be used in debug mode. And it is optimized not for going fast, but for catching all the, all the memory problems like leaks use after free, double free, all that stuff. Um, and there's some, there's some pretty cool tricks you can do uh, to, to make that happen, which, again, I, I love talking about this stuff, but I think I'm going to try to get to some more questions here. Um, there are, there are things, I just want to make sure I say this, though. There are definitely situations right now in status quo zig that are just completely unsafe, not protected against. In, even in debug and release safe modes, is it's going to shoot yourself in the foot, um, and that's the thing that I have, my the idea that I want to try to fix. But status quo, it's a problem. Um, so that's 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 a good question. Uh, let's try to get this. Oh, you know what? It's 5 p.m. I think I'm supposed to stop. Yes, I'm supposed to stop. Okay, thanks everybody. Good questions. <laughs> <laughs>